top, top. All right, I guess we can get started. Thank you all for being here. Of course, it is a true honor today uh, to have Chair Jay Powell and former chair and Nobel laureate Ben Bernanke with us today. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I've very much been looking forward to this conversation. I'm sure our audience has too, uh, so let's just get to it. Um, this conference, uh, as everyone knows, is dedicated to the memory of Tomas Laubach. And earlier this morning, we heard some personal reflections on working with Thomas. Uh, from uh, Secretary Janet Yellen, also a former chair of the Fed, and from President John Williams. And both of you uh, worked closely with Tomas as well. So I'd like to give you both an opportunity to share your own thoughts about Thomas's contributions uh, as an economist, as a central banker, as a colleague. Um, ben, maybe we could start with you. Sure, and it's great to be here. Um, I was uh, Tomas's uh, thesis advisor, and he worked with me on a book on inflation targeting when he was still a graduate student. And that was a long time ago, and he was not yet in his exalted position at the Fed when I was uh, doing Jay's job. So I don't have any short little anecdotes to give, but I do want to say that I think there are sort of two kinds of accomplishments a person can have. They can have curriculum vitae accomplishments, <clears throat> and they can have what I call eulogy accomplishments. Curriculum vitae accomplishments are things like published papers and promotions and awards and recognition. Eulogy accomplishments are the things your family remembers, you know, your, your kindness, your, your support, uh, helping other people, and so on. Uh, Tomas was one of the people who, few people, who uh, uh, scored high on, on both dimensions. Um, on, on the CV side, uh, you know, beginning with his work with, with me, he had a tremendous input into the Federal Reserve's uh, framework, uh, working on inflation targeting, working on the more recent Fed framework. Uh, he did work, I'm sure John Williams talked about uh, his work with uh, Tomas on the, on, the, on the natural rate. He worked on the effects of deficits on interest rates, again, another contribution. So a person who made a lot of intellectual contributions at important points. Uh, but as a person, he was just a very warm, kind, friendly helpful person, and he was just a joy to work with, and, uh, you know, I'm glad to be here to, you know, say, to say this about him. Thank you. Jay? Thank you, Trevor. Um, so, first of all, let me say this, this conference is a very fitting tribute to Tomas, and I'm really delighted and honored to be part of it. And let me add uh, my thanks to those of us who made all this happen here today. So, I, I first met Tomas uh, when I joined the board as a governor uh, in May 2012, almost exactly 11 years ago. And in preparing to join the board and then in the early years at the board, I, I was very focused on developing, you know, a deeper background in macroeconomics and monetary policy. Many people here at the board supported me in that process, too many to name here, but I will say Tomas really stood out. And it was during the process of reading, you know, the literature and discussing it that I really started to get to know him. He had this great ability to communicate complicated ideas. He obviously loved talking about economics and he, his great enthusiasm and willingness to engage with me, a, you know, a new governor, was uh, immediately evident. He was very gracious to me and we had a lot of informant, uh, informative discussions. So rather than being his teacher, I was really his student in those early years. Um, as you know, by the time, uh, as you noted, uh, Tur, by the time I became chair in 2018, Tomas was uh, the head of the Division of Monetary Affairs. And in that role, he was a trusted advisor to me and to the FOMC. Um, his leadership was particularly important as the FOMC conducted our first ever public monetary policy review. He played a major role in organizing that, identifying key topics, and organizing the staff all through the Federal Reserve System. He also played an absolutely essential role during uh, the critical uh, 
period of the pandemic at the very beginning when we were marshalling our forces and our tools to stabilize the financial system and protect the economy from even more dire consequences. And through it all, he, he did come through as not just for his dedication, his great intellect and his, his uh, mastery of monetary economics, but also just for his kindness as a human being and, and just as in being a terrific, great colleague and a great person. Thank you. I think there's a lot of agreement for the sentiments that both of you have expressed. Appreciate that. Um, before we get to some questions on some current issues, uh, I did want to ask you both about any formative experiences that you may have had that have shaped your views, uh, particularly about your thinking about monetary policy. Um, Paul Vol Volker, in his oral history interview, uh, tells the story of his mother, who was adamant that he received the same dollar value monthly allowance when he was in college that his older sisters did 10 years prior. And of course, he was not too happy about that because inflation in the interim had obviously uh, eroded the real purchasing power of that allowance. Um, so as the story goes, that uh, was the beginning of his uh, personal commitment uh, to price stability. <laughs> so Jay, do you have any such uh, stories to tell? Maybe, maybe not quite that on point, but um, <laughs> so I graduated from college in 1975 during what we now call the Great Inflation, and uh, same, same college year as Ben. And I started working as a lawyer in the financial sector in the late 1970s. I recall from that time a growing sense that high inflation was essentially a permanent part of the landscape, just something that we all had to accept and deal with, and that the costs of getting rid of it were too high. So you just were getting used to it. Um, of course, ultimately, the Fed did step up and restore price stability. And uh, one lesson from that era is that price stability is really the foundation of a strong economy, and that the economy doesn't work for anyone without price stability. Another is that high inflation is, it is, when we have high inflation, it is the responsibility and the obligation of the central bank to restore and sustain price stability. So today, while inflation isn't as high as it was uh, when I was in college, it's nonetheless far above our 2% objective. And many people are currently experiencing high inflation for the first time in their lives. Uh, it's not a headline to say that they really don't like it. Uh, you know, so we are um, very aware that high inflation uh, imposes significant hardship as it, uh, as it reduces purchasing power, especially for those who are at the margins of the economy and uh, living paycheck to pe paycheck and need to pe use all of their incoming income to pay for food, housing, and transportation and other, uh, other essentials. And that's why the committee is so strongly uh, committed to return returning to our 2% goal. We think that failure to get inflation down would, would not only prolong the pain, but also increase, ultimately, the social costs of getting back to price stability, causing even greater harm to families and businesses. And we aim to avoid that by remaining steadfast in pursuit of our goals. Thank you. Ben. Well, I had mentors, uh, Dale Jorgensen at Harvard and Stanley Fisher at MIT in particular, but I'm going to tell you about something that happened to me when I was six years old. Um, I used to visit my grandparents in Charlotte, North Carolina during the summer, and I would sit on the front porch of their house and listen to my grandmother tell stories about her life, and she told about how uh, she raised her family in Connecticut in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And it was a town that was specializing in shoe manufacture. And at, during the Depression, a lot of the factories were shut down. And she told me that uh, you know, it was a very hard time. A lot of the kids went to school in tattered shoes or, or maybe no shoes at all. And I said, Grandma, why, why would they do that? And she said, well, because their fathers lost their jobs. Why did they lose their jobs? Because the shoe factory shut down. Now, I was only six years old, but I could see the problem with that argument. I said, well, why didn't they just open the shoe factories and make shoes for the children? And she said, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. But I, I think it was, really was a puzzle to me that you had the same productive capacity in 1933 that you had in 1928. And in 1928, people were dancing the Charleston. And in 1933, they were in bread lines. And that really impressed on me, you know, that, that economics can make really big difference in people's lives. And monetary policy is like that. I mean, it's, as uh, Jay, of course, and all of you well know, that the decisions made in this building have uh, a very broad and, and, and real effect on people's lives. And uh, for that reason, besides its intellectual fascination, it's, it's worth studying and understanding. Yeah. Thank you. I know that's certainly a 
key motivation for many people in this room <laughs> to be working so hard. Um, okay, let's now turn to some uh, topics of, of more current interest. Um, and I'd like to start with uh, the nexus between the financial system and the macro economy. Um, both of you, uh, during your tenures as chair, have faced very significant historic uh, financial crises. Um, ben, obviously, you confronted the global financial crisis, and Jay, the, the global pandemic. Those episodes were clearly uh, acute, uh, very vivid examples of the connections between the macro economy and the financial system, um, as well as, a, I think, a good illustration of the role of central banks in such episodes. Um, but Ben, your research, importantly, and the research that you have inspired, has really demonstrated that understanding the connections between the financial sector, credit markets, uh, and banks, and the real economy is critical for even understanding traditional business cycles. Mm -hmm. um, so with that as background, we have just experienced uh, a period of stress in certain parts of the banking system here in the United States. So I want to get your take on uh, those developments, how you think uh, they, sh they match up compared to some previous episodes, and, and what they might mean for the economy. Well, in some dimension, the recent crisis has followed the, the standard sequence. Um, I don't know anything about Silicon Valley Bank other than what I read in the paper, so please don't uh, misinterpret this. But it was a, a classic situation where uh, they had um, assets that were subject to risk, and in particular, as interest rates rose, the value of their long-term assets fell and their capital fell. Uh, they had hoped to hedge that by uh, their deposit uh, franchise, where uh, as interest rates rose and interest rates moved more slowly on deposits, that would partially compensate, but they were dealing uh, with customers who were very uh, media, uh, social media savvy, and, and that didn't really work. So after the decline in capital, you had the second stage, which is runs, people taking out their money, um, which ultimately led uh, to uh, the collapse of the bank, despite, I may add, the uh, good efforts of the Fed and the FDIC to provide liquidity and provide support uh, for depositors. The third stage uh, of a banking crisis is contagion, and people looked at other banks and said, oh, they look sort of vaguely like Silicon Valley Bank. They got the same number of letters in their name and all kinds of things <laughs> like that, and, and that, caused for, that caused people to begin to remove you know, deposits uh, elsewhere. Um, and, and finally, the, 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 the reason this is important um, uh, is that it ultimately affects uh, credit conditions. And, uh, the Federal Reserve is, of course, uh, looking at the effects of, of uh, bank problems and, and other financial issues on the extension of credit and, and therefore, on, on, on the real uh, economy. Um, so, you know, in that respect, I think it's uh, very similar to uh, other crises. I think it's different from the global financial crisis in many ways, including its scale and scope, of course, but uh, I would mention uh, a couple of things a couple of important differences. One is that the impaired asset in this case was U.S. Treasuries, uh, which are very different <clears throat> assets in kind from subprime mortgages, in that U.S. Treasuries can always be valued accurately, and so there's not the uncertainty that was associated with uh, subprime mortgages. And secondly, as the economy declines, if it does decline, uh, U.S. Treasuries actually become more valuable rather than less valuable, and so there's, there's kind of a countercyclical Effect. So that's, that's one very important difference, I think. And then the other uh, worth mentioning, but very important, is that relative to, say, the GFC or the Great Depression, overall, borrowers are in much better shape you know, than they were uh, in these previous episodes. And that makes a big difference, both in terms of the stability of the banks and also in terms of the impact on consumer spending and the economy in general. Well, I guess... A major reason that situation didn't get worse, and I think the contagion was very much contained, were the forceful actions, Jay, that, that you and the Federal Reserve took uh, through, through the use of your liquidity tools, including uh, the creation of the bank term funding program. Um, however, in deploying these liquidity tools, uh, you know, that has come at, you know, against this backdrop where the uh, preeminent monetary policy concern is high inflation. And that's, of course, a little different from some of the earlier episodes and has raised uh, renewed discussions about uh, the so-called uh, separation principle, right? And so I wanted to ask you how you think about uh, the use of financial stability tools and liquidity tools as opposed to more traditional monetary policy tools uh, and how they fit together. 
It's an interesting question, but I want to start by saying, though, that the overall, uh, the banks and the banking system are strong and resilient and well positioned to deal with the challenges they may face now or in the future. So uh, as you pointed out, we do have separate tools, monetary policy to achieve our macroeconomic objectives, liquidity, supervisory, and regulatory tools to address financial stability issues. But I see an important distinction between separation, this is the separation principle, separation and independence. Our tools can have separate objectives, but their effects are often not entirely independent. So the tools are complementary almost all of the time because financial and macroeconomic stability are so deeply intertwined. In fact, our consensus statement uh, notes that sustainably achieving maximum employment and price stability depends on a stable financial system. So because they're so intertwined, to me, there is not likely to be an absolute and complete separation of the tools, nor is that possible or desirable. And I, I think as Ben's research, research and the global financial crisis demonstrated, financial stability affects macroeconomic stability and vice versa. We saw that clearly at the outset of the pandemic. As a result, the tools that we use to address concerns in either arena can and will affect both, especially during extreme circumstances. That said, yes, the tools are separate, they have individual purposes, and most of the time each can be used for its intended purpose without comprising, compromising the other. For example, uh, as you pointed out, when banking stresses emerged in early March, we used our liquidity tools, the discount window and the bank term funding program, to make liquidity available to banks that might need it. And that liquidity supported the stability of the financial system without restricting the use of our monetary policy tools to promote price stability. While the financial stability tools help to calm conditions in the banking sector, developments there, on the other hand, are contributing to tighter credit conditions and are likely to weigh on economic growth, hiring, and inflation. So as a result, our policy rate may not need to rise as much as it would have otherwise to achieve our goals. Of course, the extent of that is, is highly uncertain. So. Yeah, thank you. Um, and of course, that I think the effectiveness of those tools is reflected in uh, in the fact that the FOMC um, has actually raised interest rates twice since the emergence of the banking strains. Uh, of course, in that, the purpose of that is to uh, uh, confront the inflation issue, um, which brings us to our next topic, which is, in fact, inflation. Um, you know, in the pandemic and the aftermath, uh, we've had many renewed discussions of the important and classic uh, textbook distinction between supply shocks and demand shocks. Um, and in particular, the particular challenges that a supply shock uh, can present to, to a central bank. Um, and that's also raised a lot of questions in, in academia and in policy circles as to whether or not the inflation process uh, post-pandemic is going to look quite different than prior. Um, Jay, maybe we can start with you. Um, a number of folks have uh, argued that we are entering a new period where supply shocks will be more frequent, um, we'd love to hear your views on your, uh, whether you think that's a possibility and what that might mean for central banks. So it's, it's a great question, and it's one I think we'll be dealing with for, for quite a long time. And I'd say it's certainly possible that we'll see continued supply shocks. I also think it's just very hard to forecast that with any confidence. As Yogi Berra is thought to have said, Ben, you're the baseball expert. You can, you can c confirm or deny this. But um, it is difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, so I think that the best we can do at this stage is probably to just identify the factors that we think can lead to further uh, negative supply shocks. I will say that, though, that positive supply shocks re related to globalization largely probably contributed significantly to the period of low inflation that either ended or was interrupted by the onset of the pandemic. And I'm thinking there of the, the vast increase in global labor supply, the development of efficient global supply chains, you know, facilitated by technological advances and things like that. And I would say those positive supply shocks do not seem likely to be repeated. Um, at the same time, the drivers of the current inflationary surge certainly included a sequence of large negative supply shocks to the global supply chain for goods, which also experienced a large and persistent shift in demand from services to, good, to goods and also the supply of workers. On top of that, Russia's war against Ukraine brought shock, further shocks to global supply chains, particularly supplies of energy and non-energy commodities. So we can't know how persistent those shocks will be or whether further negative supply shocks will come along. Will, the glo will globalization be partially or, or fully halted or reversed? Will it resume again as the pandemic mercifully recedes into memory? We, we can't really know that now. 
Um, but for policymakers, uh, the bottom line is that central banks will continue to be responsible for providing, uh, providing price stability, and that will require us to navigate, navigate whatever additional supply shocks do occur. So as Tomas and Ben and their co-authors wrote in the Inflation Targeting book, what a central bank can do is control inflation. And that is true over time, even in the presence of supply shocks, should they come. Ben, I'd love to hear your views on this. So unusual events uh, which disrupt normal economic functioning often are followed by inflation. Examples are World War I, World War II, the Korean War, and now the pandemic. And the pandemic just makes it harder for policymakers to understand what's happening and to react appropriately. And in particular, the pandemic uh, scrambled the labor market, made it harder to judge the state of the labor market. It, the opening led to a very extended rise in commodity prices, which was difficult to deal with. We had supply chain issues, which was a pretty much a new thing, which was also a contributor to inflation. So there, there are many features of the pandemic that made this an unusual episode and a difficult uh, episode to address. Um, that being said, I, I think that, and I've done some research on this, this with Olivier Blanchard that we're presenting next week, um, the, the basic mechanisms, I think, are still the same. If you, but you have a bunch of bad shocks, that's going to give you a problem. But uh, the underlying mechanisms of supply shocks and tight labor markets and so on are, are really the same. So I think, you know, I don't think there's been a, a, a major change in the underlying process that generates inflation, only a, a series of shocks related to the pandemic that, that gave us this, uh, this episode. Going forward, I, I agree with Jay that we, we can't predict, um, you know, what new shocks will come. We've got uh, new technologies out there that might, you know, make big changes in our economy. Um, we've got, uh, you know, green investment, things like that, that might affect the price and availability of uh, fossil fuels. And, and so there are many, many things that we can't, can't predict. But I, I think that, broadly speaking, that uh, the inflation process has not changed. And it's one aspect of that, which is very good news, is that the Federal Reserve's credibility <coughs> has helped keep inflation expectations, particularly longer-term inflation expectations, reasonably well anchored, which is always sort of the first step in getting control <coughs> of inflation. You mentioned the uh, role of the labor market tightness in the inflation process. Um, I think it's quite striking that prior, right on the eve of the pandemic, the unemployment rate was around 3.5%, a you know, five-decade low. Uh, and yet at the same time, inflation was kind of struggling to get up to 2% <coughs> on a sustained basis. Here we are uh, in 2023. The unemployment rate is roughly at the same level as it was prior to the pandemic. But, of course, inflation is far above uh, 2%. Um, so in that context, um, should we be thinking about the relationship between slack in the labor market and inflation differently? Do we not have the right measures of slack? Is it the problems with understanding what the natural rate of unemployment is? Uh, or, is that really, or is slack really not the key to understanding inflation in the first place? Dan, you want to take that well, one first? As I was uh, talking about before, I think that the uh, pandemic, to some extent, scrambled the usual signals from the labor market. And the Federal Reserve over time has begun to put more weight on things like the vacancy to unemployment ratio, which seems to give a better signal in a period of change when um, uh, the labor market matching process is, is in change uh, than the unemployment rate. So uh, there has been some scrambling of those signals. Um, that being said, <coughs> it's a simply not true that, you know, even in, people have understood since the 70s that there's not a simple inverse relationship between inflation and unemployment. Um, in particular, uh, what can break that relationship is supply shocks. And so during the 70s, we didn't particularly have tight labor markets most of the time. We had high inflation, A, because we had oil price shocks, which the Fed did not respond to adequately, B, because inflation expectations were not well anchored, and there was a strong tendency for uh, price increases to feed into wage increases to feed into price increases. So because of the presence of supply shocks and inflation expectations dynamics, there's no reason why you know, low unemployment and high inflation can't coexist. Uh, but uh, the, the remedies might be, you know, depending on the situation, might be somewhat different. 
Jay, how are you thinking about that? So I'm very much in agreement with that. You know, it, it's certainly true that we had uh, both before and after the pandemic inflation very, sorry, unemployment very low, close to three and a half percent, but that we only had high inflation after the pandemic. Does that mean that our understanding of the relationship between slack and inflation is badly wrong or that it has changed fundamentally after the pandemic? And my answer would be tentatively no to both of those questions. I think what, what really is different this time was the series of unexpected and persistent supply shocks that featured in the inflation process. I don't think labor market slack was a particularly important feature of uh, inflation when it first spiked in uh, spring of 2021. By contrast, I do think that labor market slack is likely to be an increasingly important factor in inflation going forward. In particular, inflation in non-housing services is showing signs of real persistent. In this highly diverse uh, sector, labor costs are a high proportion of, of total costs, and, and that sector happens to account for more than half of, of, uh, of the core PCE index. Um, but all, all of this, the point is, all of this can be explained, I think, using our standard framework for understanding labor market slack. You could say it uh, this way, that the natural rate of employment probably rose sharply as the pandemic severely disrupted the labor market. And the implication of that would be that an unemployment rate of, say, 4% uh, indicated a much t tighter labor market in 2021 than it did in 2018. Um, and as Ben mentioned, of course, after the pandemic, we began looking at much more closely at alternative measures, particularly vacancies, but also quits, which have been signaling even greater tightness than the unemployment rate alone might have, been, might have thought to have been to signal. I mean, to, to, to put some numbers on it, um, we, at the end of 2018 and the end of 2021, we had 4% roughly unemployment in both cases. In 2018, the vacancies to unemployment ratio was one to one, essentially. In 2021, it was two to one. And that was a much better indicator, obviously, at that time of the simple standalone unemployment rate. Although, as I mentioned, you could also think of it as the, the natural rate being highly elevated. The, the other thing is, you know, the, um, it may also be the case that the Phillips curve has steep, steepened, meaning that inflation has returned, at least for now, to being more responsive to changes in the labor market, in labor market slack. But, you know, the Phillips curve um, was once thought to be fairly steep uh, after flattening. Relationships in the economy, like the Phillips curve, evolve over time, so I would not characterize that as a problem for our understanding of inflation. Very good, thank you. Um, maybe we can pivot here to the topic of central bank communications. Um, it's widely understood now that the better the public understands uh, the conduct of monetary policy, the more effective it will be. Um, but fostering that type of understanding really requires a lot of uh, communications. And of course, that can be hard. Um, both of you have been powerful advocates for advancing monetary policy communications, both with an eye toward making policy more effective uh, but also for the purposes of promoting transparency and accountability. Um, ben, you've obviously played a critical role here advancing the FOMC's communications, including the introduction of uh, press conferences after FOMC meetings, uh, the introduction of the summary of economic projections. Um, so what changes over this period uh, since the communication, say, revolution began, would you highlight as being some of the most effective, most important, and where do some remaining challenges exist? Well, let me talk about communication because I think you need to understand that it serves multiple purposes. <clears throat> I mean, what, one of its purposes, the narrow purpose, is to try to align market expectations with the Fed's own thinking. Um, and I think that goes back to Alan Greenspan. If you go back to 1994, the first FOMC statement. I mean, since then, uh, you know, the Fed has tried at least to give some indication uh, of what it's thinking and what it sees as the risks to the economy. But beyond that, uh, you mentioned transparency and accountability. This is a powerful institution. Uh, it's very important that it be accountable to the Congress and to the public, and the best way to do that is explain what we think, what we're doing, you know, and how, and, and how we're going to go about that. Um, there's other reasons for uh, communication. One I would talk about is uh, feedback. Uh, we're having a conference here. Um, if the Fed puts out the issues that it's concerned about, um, Economists will, will write articles or, or tweet <laughs> and uh, respond to that. Um, or in the case of uh, the Fed Listens program, maybe it would be more ordinary people who are explaining you know, how, how monetary policy affects them. 
Uh, one final thing I would mention is, uh, is diversity of views. Because the Fed has a consensus culture, and there are very few dissents normally, uh, the outside perception is the Fed is, is subject to groupthink, which of course is possible, but with people talking about you know, their own views and explaining why they, you know, why they see the economy as, as, as they do, it, it does, I think, at least to some extent, show that there is a range of opinion uh, on, the, on the committee. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of, of uh, tools, I, I guess I do feel proud about the press conferences, which I introduce four times a year after the um, summary of economic projections in which Chair Powell has taken to a, an art form. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, uh, I think also, you know, just the, uh, the inflation target, the, uh, the, the forecasts that we release, and th there's a cultural change which some people don't like, but I think on the net is, is good, which is it used to be, uh, if you look back at speeches in the Greenspan era, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, you know, would talk about, you know, harvests or something, wouldn't talk very much about the global or national economy. Now you have a lot of people talking <clears throat> about, you know, the different aspects of the Federal Reserve's views. And, uh, again, that contributes uh, to both... Uh, market transparency and also to accountability to the local constituency and to the national constituency. Jay, you of course have continued to push forward on the communications and transparency fronts. Welcome your thoughts. You know, I, I think the broader setting is that um, transparency is especially important today. Um, polling data show that many important uh, public and private institutions globally have struggled to retain the public's trust and support in recent years. Now, we're an institution that serves a critical public mission, but to, to be here and work here is to know that the particulars of what we do and how we do it are not generally top of mind for, for most people. Um, and on top of that, we have a critical and a rare grant of independence. And all of that, to me, means that we have a special obligation to explain ourselves clearly what we do, why we do it, to provide transparency to the public and their elected representatives in Congress so that we can earn and deserve their trust and support. And that's, that's a critical task if we are going to sustain our democratic legitimacy through this, this uh, interesting period. My colleagues and I really take that as a primary and affirmative proactive obligation and not something we see as a burden or of sector, second order importance. So in that spirit, uh, to your point, we have followed the example of Chairman Greenspan beginning in 1994 with the first post-meeting statement through Ben's, you know, uh, innovations and Janet as well in looking to foster greater transparency and accountability. And a couple of examples, we now do a press conference after every meeting, not just every other one. We have greatly expanded our congressional outreach to be certain that we hear directly from lawmakers on an ongoing basis uh, so that they, and also so that they have the information that they need to conduct appropriate oversight. As I mentioned, uh, in, in 2019 and 20, we conducted a public review of our monetary policy framework seeking input from a broad range of people and groups all around the country. We've also significantly expanded transparency beyond monetary policy. For example, we now publish semi-annual financial stability and supervision and regulation reports. Of course, there are always uh, communication challenges, uh, especially, uh, I find, about communicating the uncertainty that attends our assessments of economic conditions and the outlook. Um, and a good, a good example of this is, despite our persistent efforts to explain otherwise, the policy, policy paths from the SEP seem regularly to be taken as a firm plan or a committee decision, rather than what they are, which is a compilation of ind individual participants' best assessments on a particular day of appropriate policy under the assumption that conditions evolve in line with their base, baseline forecasts. So that's just a challenge that we, we constantly face in the context of great uncertainty. Despite that, I would say, though, that the, that the summary of economic projections has actually been very useful during this tightening cycle as markets have looked ahead and priced in future rate hikes you know, long before they're actually implemented. Your last point really uh, brings up the idea of communications as being a, an effective policy <clears throat> tool. Uh, and I guess the key element of that is the use of forward guidance. Um, Jay, in one school of thought, forward guidance is a tool that is, should really only be deployed when interest rates are at the effective lower bound. And so you can no longer provide accommodation by lowering rates further, and so you do so through <clears throat> communicating about the policy path in the future. 
Um, but another school of thought, forward guidance should be just a regular part of communicating with the public to convey the committee's policy intentions even far away from the effective lower bound. Where do you come out in that debate? Well, I, think it, I do think it depends on circumstances. I, I do think that um, forward guidance can be useful when policymakers have a materially different or clearer view of the likely path of policy than does the interested public. I would agree at the effective lower bound when we need to provide more stimulus by indicating an intent to keep policy accommodative longer than the public expects. There's a, there's a use case there. I, I also would say, though, that communication comes with a cost of misrepresent, misinterpretation, and it also may limit flexibility. So I think we should use forward guidance sparingly when the course of policy is either reasonably well understood or, on the contrary, is so uh, dependent on uncertain future developments that little really can be said uh, constructively about the future. And a good example of that was uh, the March 2020 FOMC meeting. Uh, the pandemic shutdowns were just beginning. The, the level of certainty was almost unimaginable, and we chose not to issue an SEP at that point. Really, our view was that releasing a forecast at that time might have been more of an obstacle uh, to clear communication than a help. Um, in contrast, as I mentioned a minute ago, forward guidance has really been a useful and effective tool during the current tightening cycle as financial conditions have tightened well in advance of actual rate increases. You know, the two-year tightened between the September 21 meeting and, the, and, and liftoff in March of 20, it tightened by 200 basis points before we ever actually lifted rates, and that's significantly because of our communication. So the, in the current context, until recently, it's been relatively clear that further policy firming would be warranted, and our forward guidance has said so, has said so. Now, however, we've come a long way in policy tightening, and the stance of policy is restrictive, and we face uncertainty about the lagged effects of our tightening so far and about the extent of credit tightening from recent banking stresses. So today, our guidance is limiting, limited to identifying the factors we'll be monitoring as we assess the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate to return inflation to 2% over time. As I noted at the last press conference, that assessment will be an ongoing one as we move ahead, meeting by meeting. Having come this far, we can afford to look at the data and the evolving outlook and make careful assessments. Thank you. Jay, you mentioned uh, that gu guidance can be useful at times when uh, the public may expect a very different policy path than policymakers. How do you think about those sorts of situations? You're, you're right. So recently it has sometimes been the case that markets appear to be pricing in a different rate path than the committee expects will be appropriate. But I would say that that disconnect does not seem to reflect a misunderstanding of our reaction function or a lack of belief that we'll do what's necessary to bring inflation down. Rather, it appears to reflect simply a different forecast, one in which inflation comes down much more quickly than the committee, committee participants think is most likely, perhaps due to a significant downturn. I would say also, so far the data cont have continued to support the committee's view that bringing inflation down will take some time. Moreover, uh, it, something we, we often don't remember to, to think about is that market prices always reflect both expectations and compensation for risk. And what, what market participants say in surveys of their expectations is actually closer to the views in the SEP than what is reflected in market pricing. Um, so ultimately, my colleagues and I have our forecasts and market participants have theirs. Our role is not to advocate for our forecast. What we can do is be clear about our expectations for growth, unemployment, and inflation, and the likely implications for, for policy. As well, we want to, the public to understand how policy would react if the path of the economy were to differ materially from our expectations. And of course, we do lay out our individual forecasts quarterly. Ben, what would your takeaways be for the past couple of decades' use of forward guidance as a policy tool? Well, uh, Charlie Evans and co-authors have made a useful distinction between what they call Odyssean and mm -hmm. Delphic forward guidance. Odyssean forward guidance is a commitment forward guidance, which is rarely used, but some, typically at the lower bound, where the central bank promises to do something, its credibility on the line, that it will follow a certain path going forward, and that's a way of getting more stimulus, and I think, again, that goes back, uh, again, to Alan Greenspan, I think, to, uh, to indicate that uh, a certain path was very likely and that uh, actually helps uh, achieve uh, the objectives. Delphic forward guidance is basically just a forecast. Here's what we think, 
tomorrow we might think something different, but we're just trying to, as part of our transparency, we're just trying to give you a sense of where the economy is going and how we think policy will, will react. Now, as, as Jay points out, there, there are some problems in practice. Um, one is people don't understand the difference all the time between a commitment and a <coughs> forecast. That's something that Jay has emphasized and I think uh, should be emphasized. Another is people uh, <coughs> underestimate the amount of uncertainty involved, which is enormous. So I, I don't think you can do without some form of tra uh, forward guidance because the idea of transparency says, here's what we see. Uh, and here's how, why we're thinking. And so the idea that there's no guidance at all, most of the time, I, I mean, I, I take March 2020 as a counterexample, but most of the time you do want to give at least a sense of where you think uh, the economy and, and accordingly policy are, are heading. I think, uh, just if I might editorialize one more minute, the, I think one of the issues is that the FOMC is so large and geographically dispersed that it's been difficult to come up with a collective committee forecast we tried to do that when I was chair. Uh, the dot plot is a compromise, which is not ideal. Uh, other central banks do other things. Sometimes they have collective uh, committee forecasts that are voted on, or they use market uh, rates, uh, or they publish the staff forecast. So there are different ways to go about this. But uh, again, I, I think that forward guidance is both an instrumental tool, but again, letting people know sort of how the central bank sees the evolving situation even if there's lots of uncertainty, which you can say, uh, normally is, is part of, of transparency. So you highlighted uncertainty uh, as being a key factor in, in dealing with some of these issues. Obviously, uncertainty is a <clears throat> pervasive feature of monetary policy making um, and uh, often invokes uh, you know, the so-called risk management approach to making monetary policy. Um, maybe we can start, Jay, with you on this topic. <clears throat> the FOMC has raised the uh, federal funds rate by five percentage points in a little more than a year. His that's a very rapid pace by historical standards, as we all know. How uh, do you view those actions in the context of the uncertainties that you and the committee faced about the economic outlook, and how did risk management considerations factor into your decisions? So I'll, I'll start by remembering that Alan Greenspan famously said that pervasive uncertainty was the defining characteristic of the policy landscape. It's worth remembering that he made that comment during what we now think of as the great moderation. <laughs> um, so that statement has never been more apt than it is today. Uh, if you look back the pandemic, the global shutdown, the historically forceful response and the reopening, all of that had no modern precedent. So it has been a time of historically elevated uncertainty and of unexpected outcomes. No advanced economy had ever faced a shutdown and a reopening, and now uh, all of them would face it at the same time. So no, no matter what happened, the outcome was going to be unprecedented. So this level of uncertainty posed, posed real challenges for policy and policy communications. On the one hand, we wanted to be, we had to be nimble to be able to respond to the evolving uh, situation. On the other hand, we wanted to be as clear as possible about, about what we were doing lest we add to uncertainty. So I would say policy certainly has been nimble. Um, uh, consistent with what were then our expectations, the data did actually show declining inflation through September of 2021, but then turned decisively against that expectations thereafter. And we, in response, we accelerated our policy firming, ultimately, as you noted, raising rates by 500 basis points in just over a year. Um, over this period, we com communicated that the object was to reach a stance of policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. But we also communicated that the level of rates that would ultimately be required was highly uncertain. <clears throat> now, until very recently, it's been clear that further policy firming would be required. As policy has become more restricted, the risks of doing too much versus doing too little are becoming more balanced, and our policy has adjusted to reflect that fact. So we haven't made any decisions about the extent to which additional policy firming will be appropriate. But given how far we've come, as I noted, we can afford to look at the data and the evolving outlook and make careful assessments. Ben, when you became a policymaker, you uh, were well versed in sort of the academic literature on decision making. Yeah, I moved from that side to this side. Um, yeah. <laughs> how does it work in I, practice? I say uncertainty when you're an academic is trying to decide whether your error term is Gaussian or not. Um, <laughs> in, uh, in, in actual policy making, you don't even know what the current quarter GDP is because it's going to get revised you know, several times down the road. I remember 
when I was sitting uh, on the, just as a member of the board and, and Greenspan was in, in, in the chair, and uh, we had responded to some uh, inflation data, and, and a little bit later it turned out that that inflation change had been revised away. And I asked the chair, do you think we can revise our interest rate policy? <laughs> <laughs> um, it is very difficult. I mean, I, I, this, I, <laughs> got to laugh with that, but, uh, it, you know, just trying to make policy, it involves not just uncertainty about, you know, the data, about the model, about all the things that can happen, about the social and economic and political environment. Um, so it's very difficult, and unfortunately, or fortunately, the given that monetary policy works with a lag, um, given that there are risks on both sides of the, of the uh, modal forecast, there's not much choice but just to uh, accept that uncertainty and try and you know, do the best you can, being ready to adjust as new information arrives. Very good, thank you. We are getting close to the end of our allotted time. Um, maybe we could wrap up with just a que question looking ahead. Um, Jay, maybe we can start with you. What do you, what would you point to as some of the key issues that will be most relevant to the research community as well as uh, to the policymaking community? So I guess, I guess I would start with the labor market and, you know, what we talked about earlier of um, um, vacancies in particular and, and the beverage curve and, and the, the whole discussion over, over whether um, the, the extraordinarily high level of surplus demand in the labor market can be lessened through the vacancies channel without a significant increase in, uh, in unemployment. That would be more akin to what has happened in, in all prior cycles or most prior cycles. So that's, that's gonna be a question that we will resolve empirically. But I think we're learning <clears throat> new things about the workings of the labor market, at least in this one uh, situation. I think on, um, uh, on monetary policy, it's going to be interesting to look back and try to understand how inflation spread from what was very, uh, at the beginning, very focused on the goods sector due to the rotation of demand from services to goods and, and the tremendous amount of support that, that goods purchases got from fiscal and monetary stimulus. How did it spread then through, uh, really into the service sector where, where, where it now significantly resides? I think we're seeing much progress on, on goods and, and we, are, we have progress in the, in the pipeline on housing services, but where we see persistent inflation is now in the service sector. So what is the mechanism by which that happens? And what are the implications? Ben, you have the last word. Well, I think one of the things that I would urge researchers to look at is the relationship between monetary policy and financial stability, a very, very difficult relationship. Um, if you read the papers, you see that everybody has a very strong opinion about this subject, but they don't necessarily correlate. Um, as Mark Twain once said, uh, uh, the things you don't know can hurt you as much as the things that you know for sure, but ain't so. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I think that we really do not understand uh, to the extent that we need to uh, the relationship between different aspects of monetary policy, uh, risk-taking, uh, balance sheet behavior, et cetera. Um, and uh, it's just something, uh, there's a lot of good work being done, don't, don't get me wrong, but uh, I think we need to understand much better uh, you know what the, you know what the channels are, and, and to quantify the relationships so that we can think about what extent we need to take that into account uh, in monetary policy. Very good. Well, let me thank both of you tremendously for sharing your perspectives with us today. It's been a highlight of our conference honoring Thomas Lobach, um, and so thank you very much. A round of applause. <laughs>